introducing our next speaker, who um, is a kind of uh, demonstration by himself that the voice of science is something that is both needed and can be heard in, in societies when we deal with risk and try to understand, mitigate, protect um, uh, on risks. So, Professor Thomas Sargent is, um, well, earned his PhD from Harvard University and made a long way from that. Um, he is professor, he has been professor of economics um, at the University of Minnesota, at the University of Chicago, at Stanford University, um, and uh, more recently at New York University since September 2002, and that's a joint appointment between the economics department of the Faculty of Art and Science and the Stern School of Business. Well, notoriously was awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Economics, which was chaired with Princeton University um, Prof Professor Christopher Sims for his empirical research on cause and effects in the macroeconomy. Um, Professor Sargent is past president of the Econometric Society of the American Economic Association and of the Society for Economic Dynamics. He is the author of numerous articles and many books um, with co-authors such as Robert Lucas, um, as Francois Weld, and uh, his recent, one of his most recent book is called Robustness, which is very timely, and wrote that with uh, Lars Peters Hansen. I cannot um, delve more in, <laughs> in that, and it's probably better than we pass our time listening to you, Professor. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, it's a, it's a privilege to be on the stage with the people who are here. Um, I'm here to honor uh, Massimo Marinacci and, um, in public. I've, I've honored him uh, many times in private uh, by um, struggling to understand his papers and then also, and then also very profitably uh, using ideas in his papers uh, to do applied work. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about doubts. And uh, you could view these two um, comments by these English gentlemen as uh, comments, different attitudes toward the financial crisis, uh, the half full and the half empty. So Oscar Wilde says uh, knowledge would be fatal. It is the uncertainty that charms one. A miss makes things beautiful. I wonder if bondholders yesterday and today think that, oh, well, well. And the second is uh, Shakespeare. Um, who is more like the bondholders or more like Blanchard? Um, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Um, those are the most beautiful things I'm going to say today. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about uncertainty. Um, so the outline is going to be, what is it? Why do we care? How do we represent it or describe it? How do we measure it? Who confronts it? How does it affect equilibrium concepts? What does it do to quantities and to prices? That's everything economists care about. Oh, one more thing. How does it affect the design of good government policies? OK, so go down the list. What is it? Um, fear of model misspecification. That's a bad slide because what's a model? So for me, a model is a stochastic process. So what a, pro a stochastic process is, it's a probability distribution over a sequence. So think of a sequence of numbers. Every one of them is a random variable and they're jointly distributed. For me, that's a model. Do you have a problem with that? 
Okay. So, what is it? Fear of model misspecification. Okay, now, there's a digression on rational expectations, um, which I've, <coughs> which, with which I became infatuated in my youth, and I still am infatuated with it. And it, it, uh, it dominates macroeconomics, my field, public finance, monetary economics. I think it even dominates big parts of game theory. So um, what a rational expectation model is, it's something that's shared by every agent inside the model, by nature, and by the econometrician. There's one model. What's the model? I told you. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. So every person inside the model shares the same model. Nature shares it, and the econometrician shares it. Uh, so that's... Uh, so I call that communism. It's an extensive communism of models. So within this framework, and, and that's a very powerful method. If, you, if, you, if you're an undergraduate or graduate student and you learn the method of moments for studying asset pricing, you will use all three, all of those, you will use that communism all over the place when you do. You use GMM to estimate all other equations, just a comment. Um, Notice the following. The sharing with nature part precludes concerns about model misspecification. If you're sharing the, the model with nature, also called God, <laughs> fear of misspecification is just not there. So we can't talk about the kinds of things um, I'm going to talk about. Furthermore, what you really can't talk about is belief heterogeneity. Every, why? I said communism. Um, Everybody has, they may have different information, but they share the, short, the same probability distribution. So that is a very powerful method. You know, somebody said a scientific di discipline like economics sharpens the mind by narrowing it. And this is a huge narrowing. And it's been very, pro it's been very useful. Um, but um, I'm going to have to depart from rational expectations. But... I, and I second what Massimo said, I'm not going to go into bounded rationality. Um, I'm going to depart, uh, follow his footsteps in a way that is, it's going to be more rational than rational expectations, because I'm going to instill doubts into this setting. Um, okay. So, w so why do we care? Why do we care about model misspecification? Okay, so if, you, if you're a, an econometrics student, you know right away because you, you test somebody's model and use some likelihood ratio test and it gets blown out of the water. Our models are routinely rejected. And if that doesn't ring too, too, true to you, <clears throat> you're taking too many theory courses um, and you're not, you're, 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 you're not reading econometrics papers. They're routinely rejected. So, so um, furthermore, it's difficult statistically to distinguish alternative models from samples of the, of the typical size macroeconomists have. So doubts about which model is correct pervade um, economic science. Furthermore, there's experiments by Ellsberg that make the savage axioms that justify being a Bayesian dubious. And this is, I think this itself is a subjective thing. If, if you don't know what the Ellsberg experiment is, um, find out and do it on yourself. And you will, you, will, you will see that you care. You will see that you're not a Bayesian. Um, so I'm going to emphasize, these are two reasons. They're, they're linked. I believe that they're linked. I'm going to emphasize um, the second reason because I'm an applied economist. Okay, so I care about model misspecification. Actually, early on, my good friend Bob Lucas, when I was uh, developing rational expectations econometrics with my friend Lars Hansen um, 30 years ago, my friend Bob Lucas came up to me and said, your methods are rejecting too many good models. <laughs> and, and that led him and Ed Prescott to do calibration which I actually view lowering the standards. Um, um, but 
so this concern about misspecification, anybody who does rational expectations to econometrics is going to face this contradiction that the, the data are going to come and slap him or her in the face. So, so that's, that's a, not that you should be interested in this. This is a personal confession of how I got interested in this uh, subject. Um, OK, so how do we represent uh, fear of model misspecification? So here I'm going to follow um, Professor Gaboa and Marinacci and David Schmiedler. I'm going to have a decision maker who has a set of models, not just one model. So a Bayesian actually has a single model. Oh, you could say, wait a minute. My teacher told me how to mix models with a Bayesian prior. Um, that's a single model. Because what's a model? It's a probability distribution over a sequence. And there's only one of them at the end of the day. So what a Bayesian does is, my friend Ramon Merriman says, Bayesian knows the truth from the beginning. He, condition, he or she conditions as the information comes, learns about some stuff, but is not learning about the probability distribution. That's what Bayes' law is all about. OK, so how do we represent it? We, we divorce ourselves from the Bayesian framework by having a set of models. OK, now how do, we, how do you manage it? So my wife's not an economist. She claims not to know any math. She asked me what I was working on. I said, how to make decisions when you don't trust your model. And she shot back, I'd be mighty cautious. <laughs> That's it. Um, so how do we manage it? Um, well, you construct bounds on value functions. That's how Lars and I think about it. Um, so what you do is you, you see how your decision rule works over a set of models. It might work well for some you know, models, and it might be a disaster. But we, want it, we don't know which model prevails. So we want, we want something that's good enough. It's not going to be optimal, uh, except in one sense. Um, so we want something that's good for a whole set of models. Or you could say uh, good enough. So our tool for constructing bounds on value functions is as old as the hills. It's min-max expected utility. And this goes way back to Wald and Leo Hurwitz like this. We're going to use min-max expected utility. And, and when two guys who do robustness or ambiguity talk about this in the hall, they sound like they, they, they belong um, under the care of a psychiatrist. Because um, what they, they do is they assume that they're maximizing while nature is choosing the worst possible model given their decision rule. And they talk about an evil alter ego that's choosing the probability distribution. Um, I've heard you talk like that. Um, but they're not crazy because they don't really believe, you know, they don't really believe that there's this evil uh, person. What they're doing is, um, it's an artificial agent. And by the way, any, as my friend Lars Hansen says, uh, every economic agent is an artificial device. And, and, an economic agent is just a, constrained maximization problem um, that we use to, you know, to hopefully to, um, as a substitute for, for knowing more about psychology. It's a constrained maximization problem. So here, it's a constrained max-min problem where the minimizing agent is, is helping you construct that bound on value functions. It's, it's, not literally, it's not literally that you think there's this agent. What the agent does is it allows you to analyze the fragility of your decision rule to the set of possible um, uh, models that you think may prevail. So that's how we manage it. So I'm going to follow um, Professor Gilboa, Professor Marinacci, by using MaxMin without apology. So now how do we measure it? OK, so now this, I'm, um, by the way, Lars Hansen says congratulations. <laughs> so, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm doing something that's, that's, I'm specializing things because I'm an applied person. So this is going to be a special case of what, um, of what um, other people do. So how do we measure it? Because we're applied. Lars and I are applied. So what we're going to measure it is we're going to use relative entropy. <coughs> OK, so your reaction to that may be, oh, no. The whole reason I went into economics is I hated high school physics. 
and now this guy's talking about entropy. Um, well, that was my reaction too. So, so what is relative entropy? It's gonna, it's, all it is is an expected log likelihood ratio. And the reason it's useful is that if you go to the statistics literature, it's a statistical measure of the distance between two models. It's not a metric, but it's a measure of how far apart two models are. And by the way, the, Massimo and his co some of his co-authors have a beautiful paper generalizing this notion. Um, truly beautiful. So what this relative entropy does, it tells how difficult it is to distinguish two models statistically. And technically, you may have seen this in the econometrics class, it bounds rates at which you can discriminate between two models. But you know, if you're a Mac, so, so if you have a law of large numbers working and you can wait for uh, infinite number of observations, you can resolve a lot of misspecification problems. But um, uh, the ECB cannot do that. Um, OK, so here, here's a great, great quote, entropy. So, so why, why is it called entropy? So, von, von, so, so Shannon named it entropy. So von Neumann, um, Shannon supposedly asked von Neumann what he should call it. And von Neumann said, call it entropy. It's already in use, in, it's already in use under that name. And besides, it will give you a great advantage in debates because nobody knows what it is anyway. And my experience with macroeconomists is um, that's kind of partly true. <laughs> OK. So the question is, how do, how do Lars and I measure the size of a set of models? We measure it as a, um, a set of decision makers, statistical models, as measured by relative entropy. Uh, that's our statistical justification. OK, so just a confession. Um, Lars and I are um, applied people who do things at the lowest possible level of sophistication. Um, we did not have axioms for this, um, like a, a formal, deep mathematical justification. Um, but some people here provided them. They provided a, a much deeper justification. Um, so so um, there are now justifications. Now, the question is, who confronts, um, who can, I'm going down my list of questions. Who confronts? Uncertainty. OK, so I already told you we, the model builders, macroeconomic model builders do. OK, furthermore, OK, so now we're going to get involved in the trap of uh, rational expectations. So Lars and I think do the agents inside our models. Thanks for the quote from Olivier. Um, so do government policy makers. So, so this slide is saying, uh, this slide is a research program. This slide is several lifetimes because um, I'm, we don't have to do just single agent decision theory. We have to do multiple agent decision theories where um, the ambiguity is um, becoming pervasive, and I'll come back to that. And the question is, what's, what's the ambiguity about? And in multi-agent settings, um, you know, what are, the, what are the multiple probability distributions about? OK. And then here's the next one. Now, I'm in over my head here. But because I'm at Bocconi, there are people uh, who aren't in over their head with this. So the question is, how does it affect an equilibrium concept? So what an equilibrium concept is, is how you go from single agent decision theory to multiple agent decision theory. That's why Nash is, was, is famous, one of the reasons. And also, it's also the reason Arrow and De Bruyne are famous. So I'm going to use what I call the want operator. I'm going to tell you what I want in an equilibrium concept. And um, this is my, my preferences. So actually, every time somebody does um, science or economic science, the preferences of the researcher are, um, you don't learn about the want operator in classes, but it's widely used. It's, I want results of a certain kind. So I'm going to tell you what I want. Usually, you can't get what you want. But what I want is a con an equilibrium concept that's as close as possible to rational expectations. I want to be scientifically con conservative. So the way I'm going to get that, and now I'm, 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 I'm doing something Massimo may think is crazy. 
I'm going to attribute a common approximating model to all the agents inside my model. So they're going to, they're going to, it's, that's going to play the role of the rational expectations model. It's also going to play another role. And then, and then I'm, with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to just, with that, I'm going to stare at that, and I'm going to extend um, common equilibrium concepts. I'm either going to use a recursive competitive equilibrium, a, a specialization of Arrow de Brew by, um, Kid, by Prescott and Lucas, or I'm going to use a Nash or a subgame perfect equilibrium. I'm going to come back to that, because that's already been improved by a recent paper out of Bocconi. And that takes me to the last thing. I'm going to use a generalization of a self-confirming equilibrium, which I'll tell you about. So I'll come back to that. So we're going to have to, um, and this slide, this is in its infancy. All of this stuff is in its infancy. Um, OK, finally, um, there's, there's a, in terms of the financial crises and bubbles, so, so you'll hear a really bad place to read about the state of macroeconomics or, or scientific finance is the Financial Times or The Economist. So they'll say things like, the financial crisis proves, or the fact that there was a housing bubble proves that uh, modern finance or macroeconomists is just wrong. Well, okay, it's, well, there's first class models of bubbles that have been around for a long time. And one of my favorite is by Harrison and Krebs. And it's a model that has exogenous, it backs off of rational expectations in IOTA, and it has exogenous belief for heterogeneity. They just, they're not proud of it. They make a little tiny bit of belief heterogeneity. So they viol it's not a rational expectations model. It's almost one. And they impose some restrictions on markets. And lo and behold, they get bubbles and a beautiful definition of, uh, of, uh, of speculation. Um, but the wrap on those models is, is, uh, is you put the belief heterogeneity into the model and what justifies it. So the, the, the kind of work built, built on uncertainty, um, you can have people have a common approximating model, a common set of models that they, uh, they think might prevail. And uh, when you apply max-min with diverse interests, you will find um, min-max expected utility gives rise to ex post heterogeneity. Uh, endogenously of exactly the kind Harrison and Krebs need. Um, so it's a dis there's a discipline model of belief heterogeneity that comes out of, um, out of um, this work. And I believe that's a f an exciting frontier. There's a few papers starting to be done in that, by, in finance and in macroeconomics. Okay. I'm going down my list. So what does it do to quantities? Okay, so, so the answer is nothing. That's in a certain sense. So if you just look at implications about quantities and you do uncertainty the way uh, Lars and I do, and I'll bet it's, if it's, it'll also, a version of this will happen if you do it the way um, Fabio and Simone and Massimo, others do. There's an observational equivalence um, in terms of quantities, concern about uncertainty looks a lot like discounting. And it turns out, in certain settings, there's an exact, there's a rigid and likelihood function. And um, you can completely, uh, you can turn off concern about model uncertainty, adjust the discount factor, and you can get the same implications. So this looks like so this is an interesting result that's, that's going to, um, it's, it's haunting applied work. So if you only look at quantities, you could say there's a, there's a sense in which it's nothing. I'm going to come back and tell you why, in a vague way, why this is true. It's, and it's because, okay, disc, so did discount, so this is scratch your head. Why should discounting in intertemporal frameworks and concerns about models misspecification be linked in any way? Why should they be linked in any way? Ah, what does it do to prices? It does huge things to prices. What it does, like if you're a finance student, it makes a potentially volatile preference shock 
that's the outcome of this max-min operation, multiply the ordinary stochastic discount factor. <clears throat> it's a model of what the Financial Times calls risk preferences, that they have moving all over the place every day to explain what happened yesterday. Um, this actually generates a model of that. And in a certain setting, if you combine it with a new paper by Massimo, um, Simone and Fabio are also on this paper, um, and embedded in a hidden Markov structure, you can actually generate big volatile movements in this, in these risk factors. So the logic here is portfolio holders' worst case beliefs affect state contingent prices. And that gives rise to um, what a finance person would have talked about as a market price of risk, savage risk, but instead it's a market price of model uncertainty. Um, so this actually has had some empirical sexes. It helps ex attain the Hansen, Jake, and Athen asset pricing bounds by increasing the volatility of the stochastic discount factor under the common approximating model. That's a subtle statement, which I choose not to go into any deeper at this time. Now, here's a great question. This is kind of the attitude of, by the way, you notice I'm taking this robustness stuff really um, seriously in the following sense. A lot of these slides have the structure, who cares? Why should I care about that? So, so there's kind of an evil agent around me who's asking me questions like that. It's not Lars, because he's on board, but you know, it's my so-called friends in the macro community are asking me, why should I care about this? Oh, no. Why do I have to learn some new math? Okay, so does uncertainty, does uncertainty just look like uh, risk aversion? And the answer is yes, in some ways, but no, in some really important ways. And in particular, uncertainty aversion in the sense that I learned from people on the stage, activates attitudes about the inner temporal distribution of uncertainty that distinguish it sharply from risk aversion. And the next slide is just going to be, it's on the slide, so I'm just going to tell you this. Um, okay, so I'll tell you more about that. So can small amounts of risk aversion substitute for large amounts, of, can small amounts of uncertainty aversion just a little bit of doubt about models, substitute for massive amounts of risk aversion. So if you're a macroeconomist or a finance economist, that's a big time question. And the reason is, um, you know, to make finance theory work and to be linked to macro in the way that the models at the ECB and the Federal Reserve require, where they use a consumption Euler equation, that's an asset pricing, as their so-called new IS curve, that requires huge measures of risk aversion if, you, if you're a Bayesian. So huge that nobody believes them. Like Lucas in his AEA presidential address just tells you they're ridiculous. And what he's gonna do is ignore asset prices, ignore interest rates when he does macro. He's gonna ignore prices. Just think about that. Um, like I'm, I'm spent a long time in Chicago. I'm not gonna, you're told you have to ignore prices to match the data with a plausible risk aversion. So, so, so Lucas thinks the risk aversion, he thinks he knows the risk aversion parameter, and the reason is he read Pratt's um, experiment for calibrating the magnitude of risk aversion. That experiment um, assumes there's a known probability distribution and asks your attitude about gambles. Um, but that's not the right experiment if you think it's fear of model ma um, uncertainty. If you actually think there's a set of probability distributions, uh, the Pratt experiment isn't informative at all. Instead, um, what I do with Lars and a, and a friend, um, Anderson, is we use measures of statistical discrepancies between alternative statistical models to calibrate the mag magnitude of uncertainty. And when you do that, it's a quantitative exercise, you find that small amounts of uncertainty aversion substitute for large amounts of risk aversion. And that's a very promising line, both in macro and in, and in finance. And you could say, why do I care about that? Well, okay, you might hear that the central banks are using sophisticated models. Their sophisticated models hinge on getting and repairing the damage um, exactly on this point. So that's a point where this abstract work 
is extremely relevant. Um, um, okay, so now, how does it affect government policy design problems? This is uncharted territory. So, so, so here's the idea. Portfolio holders, if, if the portfolio holders are like the guys out there, um, like Shakespeare, who are worried about their doubts, um, their, their worst case beliefs are showing up in state contingent prices. And all I'm doing is, like I know second year, first year, Bocconi Finance, formulas for state contingent prices, they involve probabilities. I'm replacing those prob probabilities with those known probabilities in the first year with Marinacci worst case probabilities, and they're showing up in those prices. Um, so what that does is if you have a Ramsey planner, a government that's trying to manipulate the economy, what that Ramsey planner is doing is he's doing a purposeful uh, kind of belief manipulation because his choices are affecting allocations that are affecting these worst case beliefs that are showing up in asset prices that are affecting all these relations. So there's an avenue opened up. Um, so if I'm sergeant, you know, the 20, the 30 year old sergeant who's like totally in love with rational expectations and I hear me talking now, could have a Woody Allen movie on this, it would be like, the young guy thinks the old guy is totally crazy. And why? Because the young guy's a communist. Talk about belief manipulation. How could, you can't manipulate beliefs because I told you, there's one model that's shared by all the agents in the model and by nature. The guys aren't going to budge because they have no model uncertainty. But here, when you're in the world of model uncertainty and you do Ramsey planning, belief manipulation is going to come part and parcel with it. Um, so if the young guy were here, that's what I would be saying to him. Um, okay. So there's al alternative ways to uh, configure model uncertainties. Um, I'll come back to this. Massimo and Fabio and Simone and Piero Paolo's new paper on uncertainty and self-confirming equilibria to me looks like a gold mine for macroeconomists. Okay, so now, this is, this is related to a slide of Massimo, but his slide was better. So the question is, why not just learn your way out of model misspecification? You have multiple models on the time, on the table. You took econometrics at Bocconi. You know Bayes' law. You could figure out how to, way, to learn yourself uh, way out of that. Um, there's some truth to that, but not enough. I'll just say that. And so, so the question is, how do you learn when you don't have a single model? So the, our dominant theory of learning is Bayesian learning, and it's uh, use Bayes' law. Bayesian knows the correct model from the beginning. Uh, you've got to redo. You've got to redo Bayesian uh, learning theory. Um, so now I recently learned that it's being redone. You know, uh, right now. So Massimo, Simone, Fabio, and Luigi have a new paper. Extending, I think it's the fundamental, DeFinetti's fundamental theory of statistics. I view that as a, um, that paper blows me away. The only problem with that paper is should it be published in the best statistic journal or the best economics journal? Because it's, it's, it's a very fundamental paper for statistics. Um, okay. So finally, um, what does it do to public policy? What does model uncertainty do to public policy? Um, okay, so here I want to draw a picture. So in a dynamic game or a competitive equilibrium with a government, there's multiple agents and there's multiple people and there's multiple things to be uncertain about. So I'm going to show you, um, my daughter showed me a book called, um, actually she gave me this book, Seven Types of Ambiguity. I actually should have brought a copy. Um, Seven Types of Ambiguity. It's, it's, a, it's a 20th century classic in um, literary criticism. So I'm just going to show you four types. Okay. But um, Simone is going to get more than four types. 
Okay, so here, I'm going to have a Ramsey planner, which is like a government, which is a Stockelberg leader. Think about it that way. And I'm going to have a private sector that's just a competitive economy or a monopolistically competitive economy. So just think broadly. And the, the government's going to have to, it's going to be like, where's Frankfurt? It's, it's going to be like Frankfurt. It's setting taxes, you know, borrowing, regulating, doing a bunch of stuff that's impinging on the private economy. And I want, I want, I want the government to be like a Ramsey planner, so it's going to have the ability to commit. And then it's facing a private sector. Okay, so now the question is, I'm going to have some subset of these agents. So there's private agents, a whole bunch of them, and the government. So now I'm going to, um, and this is going to be a stochastic model. So under rational expectations, which we usually use, there's only a single model, and that's solving lots of things. But as soon as I say ambiguity, um, you get the following possibilities. One is, so I'm going to call type zero ambiguity. There's a Ramsey planner that trusts the approximating model, has no model uncertainty. But it knows that private agents don't. So the private agents are Marinacci type guys, and they're doing max min. And so in the prices that the government is actually going to have to take into account, and they're partly the consequences of the government's actions, they're going to be twisted probabilistically. So, OK. Turns out that's a first class problem. It's been partly solved by someone named Carantunius. OK. So that's not the only way to do it. Here's type one ambiguity. There's a Ramsey planner. So the, the whole question is this who has the set of models and who doesn't? And what are the models over? So every time I say prob models, probabilities, dimensions, dimensions in which you have multiple probabilities. So another type one is Ramsey planner has a set of models centered on an approximating model. The private sector knows the correct model. It knows the correct model. And that correct model is one of the models that's in the Ramsey planner set, but the Ramsey planner doesn't know it. So now we do max min for the Ramsey planner. But when, the, when he's doing Ramsey Planner, think, think what he's doing. Think of the calculation he's doing and what he's attributing to the beliefs of the private agents. It's a beautiful calculation. Here's type two. The Ramsey Planner has sets of models surrounding its approximating model. The private sector, it, now the private sector has no model distrust. And type three. I, 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 could, I could keep going. What's interesting is type 1 and type 2 give rise to a rich theory of belief heterogeneity, um, endogenous belief heterogeneity with a lot of structure. So that's kind of a frontier. Look, I drew these pictures. My research assistant drew the pictures. Those are different, ty those are different types. I won't go into it. OK. OK, so I have just a couple more minutes, right? OK, good. OK, just because I'm in front of Marinacci and Gaboa. I had a bunch of slides with some math on it, just because I wanted to impress them. <laughs> I even have a moment generating function. OK. Oh, I got a, OK, this is a, OK, I'll go, OK, I got dynamics. I got Bellman equations. If you're a macrocomist, you saw Sargent without a Bellman equation? No, you didn't. OK. Attitudes toward timing. There's something beautiful about robustness or uncertainty and attitudes toward the timing of the resolution of uncertainty. The interaction of dynamics. Okay, there's some beautiful things there. Okay, so optimism and pessimism. These are endogenous, these are models of endogenous optimism and pessimism. Okay, so this is, so, so macroeconomists, since before Keynes, have been talking about waves of optimism and pessimism. You know, so kind of a couple things. What are they optimistic and pessimism, pessimistic about, and why? Are they just inputs to your model? Or, well, following the lead of these guys, we can get, actually get some handle on, on, on why. You know, a, a quote unquote deep behavioral theory, uh, be behavioral and deep because it's rational. Um, OK. There's a frequency domain interpretation. I'll just tell you this. I'm going to. I want to, I got the last slide. Okay, frontiers. Frontiers. Um, so these, okay. 
Okay, frontiers. Um, and this, there's just a few people at this frontier. It's to redo general equilibrium with state contingent trading. And I, okay, I took a class from Professor uh, Girdato um, at Caltech, so I learned this. General equilibrium theory with state contingent trading. There's work by Aloisio Araujo where there's model, in, where model uncertainty can shut down some markets. And the reason it shuts down some markets is there's Max Min, Gaboa, Mar Marinacci guys, and um, they're Max Min and they have different situations and they have, even if they have the same sets of models, they're different situations and they're different interests cause them to have ex post different beliefs and there's so much belief heterogeneity that markets shut down. It's a generalization of a beautiful paper that Paula taught me by Dow and Verling. So what's exciting about this is it's, it's, a, market with, it's a model with endogenously incomplete markets. Um, so I view this as extremely promising because um, economists want to know why do some markets open? Why do some never open? Even when you know, Schiller has had ideas, brilliant ideas for mo modeling opening markets in some commodities, People have opened them, and there's been no trades in them. Why? Um, if you're a rational expectations guy, you just say, it's a puzzle, uh, meaning, I don't know. But this is actually an avenue. And finally, another frontier. And, okay, so I'm gonna sell, I'm, I'm gonna advertise a paper. Um, it's a Bocconi paper. Uh, Self-confirming equilibrium is an appealing concept for macro policy questions. They're the only possible limit points of adaptive systems with kind of naive learning. They're the only possible limit points of generalizations of what game theorists call fictitious play. So there's exciting new ideas um, which I am going to exploit uh, by a paper by uh, Badagali, um, Simone, Fabio, and Massimo. It's self-confirming equilibrium and uncertainty. And this is a paper, when I re read that paper, I said, why didn't I think of that? And, and the reason is, um, but there's still something to do because they did this in a very general game theory framework. Um, so in a self-confirming equilibrium, what happens is everybody has the right ideas about things that actually happen. But they might have wrong ideas about things that don't happen. And you could say, well, who cares about that if they have wrong ideas about things that don't happen? Well, it's the government's ideas about things that don't happen that influence the things that actually do happen. And that's why a macroeconomist uh, finds this paper exciting. So, um, so I'm glad you're young, and I, I, I plan to continue to, to try to learn from you. Thank you very much for this lecture and